Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. And I'm Pete Lane. Our guest this morning is Jim Barber. We'll be talking with Jim today about a variety of topics, ranging from his visual condition, his education, his transition to college and the workplace, and his views on blindness and independence. When I was in high school, my dad had an Apple III computer and I was able to use it and get it to do what I wanted it to do. And I decided that computers would probably be a fun way for me to make a living. In 1988, I took time off to go be one of the first students at the Colorado Center for the Blind, which actually did an awful lot to kind of strengthen and tighten my own confidence and my belief in myself. I have had several jobs, including working for a company called Qualcomm, and I worked for Google for several years, and I worked for a couple years in a company called Yahoo. The transition was mostly just me needing to learn a lot about how to advocate for myself and manage my own resources a lot better. People need to learn to do this, and it's better to learn to do it early because when you go off and get a job somewhere, there aren't people waiting around to kind of take care of the stuff for you. The question that comes up a lot around looking for jobs is when do you disclose about your blindness? The one thing that also happened there was that no one asked me anything about my blindness. And that really seemed like a bit of a red flag to me. I really kind of felt like if they don't know anything about my blindness, it's going to be really easy for them to just decide that it isn't worth the risk. They understand the problem, but it's just such a hard problem to fight. The inertia will take you in inaccessible directions unless you fight it really hard. Don't let yourself go down this inaccessible road because you'll make it really hard to hire blind people in the future. I think that IRA is absolutely going to be an invaluable tool for people in the workforce. And in fact, IRA knows that. IRA helped me quite a bit to get accommodated. I also took a couple weeks off and went traveling around Europe. And again, IRA was just very helpful in allowing me to very quickly orient myself to a neighborhood. IRA is much more efficient at that than what I used to be, which is to ask people for directions. The biggest advice I can give them is that nobody's going to look out for you but you. You need to decide that it's up to you to get the things that you need in this world. I think I am adventurous. I enjoy that. I'm a very happy, very lucky blind person. <laughs> And now let's meet our guest, Jim Barber. Good morning, Jim. Welcome to Blind Abilities. Good morning, Pete. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Jim. Our pleasure. Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your visual condition? So I was born with an underdeveloped octave nerve. I found out as a growing up that they called it octave nerve hypoplasia. I never spent a lot of time trying to figure out about a cure or anything like that. It was just a condition I had. It left me with partial vision in both eyes. When I was growing up in the 70s, they absolutely did not teach me Braille. They taught me how to read large print and how to use a closed circuit TV, even though they were sort of very fatiguing and very challenging for me. But that's how I did a lot of my schoolwork. When I got into high school, I started learning how to use readers. So that's kind of a little bit about my visual condition and a little bit about what it's done for me. I graduated from high school in the early 80s and went to University of Colorado at Boulder, where Marcy Carpenter and a gentleman named Homer Page ran the Disability Student Services Office. They were actually very strong NFB folks who insisted that blind people manage their own readers. And in my case, since I was in computer science, they actually insisted that I find my own readers because I needed to find people who could read the advanced math and the computer science that I needed. So I would go and look for them and hire them and on occasion <laughs> fire them because either they weren't doing what I needed in a timely manner or they actually didn't know how to read the material or they wouldn't follow my instructions in reading the material. I was in college for actually a very long time. I did not follow the four-year in-and-out program. I was struggling a bit to finish some classes and had to take a few classes over again. And in the middle of all that, in 1988, I took time off to go be one of the first students at the Colorado Center for the Blind, which actually did an awful lot to kind of strengthen and tighten my own confidence and my belief in myself and my NFB philosophy. I did that for seven months. I left there and went back to school. Still didn't finish, but did a much better job of taking classes and stuff. And then a couple of years later, I left there and started my career as an IT, Unix IT person. And I have had several jobs since then, including working for a company called Qualcomm twice. And I worked for Google for several years in the middle. And I worked for a couple of years in a company called Yahoo, which most of you have probably heard of as well. Jim, you studied computer science with a heavy emphasis on math courses. What drew you to computer science? When I was in high school, my dad had an Apple III computer, and I was able to use it by putting the monitor really close to my face, and then later by using the original outspoken program for the Mac. But it was just a way that I got to play with a cool toy and get it to do what I wanted it to do. So it was a lot of fun for me as a high school kid. 
And I decided that computers would probably be a fun way for me to make a living. Later on in high school, I was part of a summer work program for blind people. And I got a job learning how to do basic Unix computer stuff at the university. Again, using large print and having the monitor really close to my face. Nobody really understood about screen reading technology for Unix systems at that time. So I got to learn to do a lot of that. It was a lot of fun. And I had a lot of people around me who weren't really sure how I would do things as a blind person, but we kind of figured it out together. Later, when I started going to NFB conventions, my first NFB convention was my senior year of high school. So when I started going there, I met a bunch of other blind people who were into computer science and who showed me a bunch of different technologies for accessing computers. And I kind of got solidified on the idea that this was actually something I could do and had spent a lot of time in college, both doing work and coursework to kind of build up my skills and decide this is a job I really enjoyed and would do well at. So Jim, what was some of your first technology that you used? I know you used the early Mac, but once you decided to give up on the large print, what did you migrate into? I actually never did give up on large print. I still use large print for some things, but I also used Artix Business Vision and progressed on to different screen readers, of course, eventually landing with JAWS. And then later, of course, when the iPhone came out, I used that with VoiceOver. What I have sort of decided to do is a lot of the work I do is just work I do in a terminal, in a command prompt. And so for work like that, using large print works just fine for me. When I need to go visit busy, complicated websites with different font sizes and where there's a lot of reading involved, then I will use a screen reader of one kind or another. One thing I actually never got particularly good at was using magnification technology like Zoom and so on. What I generally did is if I could tell the program to give me a bigger font size, I would do it because I found that to be a much better experience. And if not, then I switched primarily to using a screen reader. So when you transitioned from high school and decided to go to college, how did you prepare for that? (laughs) I didn't. College was a huge wake-up call for me. High school had been a relatively easy time in my life where I had materials prepared for me, where things were either recorded for me or made readable for me in large print, and I didn't have to worry about a lot of that stuff. And then I moved on to college, where, as I said, the Disabled Students Office had pretty high expectations of their blind students. They insisted that I get readers to do recording back then. Of course, it was all recording on the cassettes and also get readers to take diagrams and other things that needed to be made readable by me and draw them out either using large pieces of paper or often I'd sit with them and they would draw them on a whiteboard. So this combination of having things enlarged and having things recorded using different readers. But it was a big transition not only in terms of needing to plan and make sure that all of my materials became accessible in a form I could read, but also it just took me longer to study. So I just had to allocate a lot more time to doing schoolwork and getting things ready to use. The other thing I had to do in college I didn't have to worry about in high school was arrange for test taking. I would have to go talk with the professor and say, I won't be able to take the test in class because I'll need someone to read it to me. And depending on the kind of test, I needed to dictate my answers and maybe do my work on a whiteboard. And so I would have to make arrangements to take the test outside of the class with a proctor from the professor. I know these days a lot of that work is done by Office of Services for Disabled Students, but at the time, the Disabled Students Office I was at insisted that I go make those arrangements. And if the professor insisted on talking with the office, the office would talk to them, but basically would say, work it out with them. The transition was mostly just me needing to learn a lot about how to advocate for myself and you know manage my own resources a lot better than I did in high school. And that's a great thing to have because once you start advocating for yourself, that's a lifelong skill that you can bring with you because you can't bring the disability services with you when you go looking for a job. That is an excellent point. And it's true that people need to learn to do this. And it's better to learn to do it early because when you go off and get a job somewhere, there aren't people waiting around to kind of take care of this stuff for you, needing to know how to do it. I also think that you come off much more professionally and much more competently if you are able to explain to people what you're going to need. And if you're able to explain to them that you'll take care of getting it done, right? If you just sort of show up and say, okay, someone's going to have to take care of this and someone's going to have to take care of this and someone's going to take care of this. That doesn't sound anywhere near as professional as, okay, I'm going to have to make sure this gets done, this gets done, this gets done. People feel much better if they know that you know what needs to happen. Especially during a job interview. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Jim, I'm curious when you had to schedule proctors and administrators for your tests, was that similar in some ways to finding readers in your specialty field where you had to find somebody who was familiar with the math and the science that you were testing on? 
similar, but so when I went to find readers, I just went and put up notices on bulletin boards near the computer science and math department, basically saying I was looking for somebody who was willing to read math and computer science textbooks out loud. I would train them how to do it, and they would get paid a little bit of money to do it. And getting paid was enough to recruit a bunch of people. And I would then sit down with them, and I would give them a sheet of special characters and tell them how I wanted those characters read. And I also showed them some simple math equations and gave examples of how I wanted them to be read. And I would have them look at it for a couple of minutes. And then I would give them some example reading. And I would sort of see how they would do with the reading. And I could tell pretty quickly, even if they didn't get it perfect, I could tell pretty quickly who was going to pick it up and who wasn't. So that was basically the job interview. When it came to taking tests, what I needed to do was to find somebody who could do that reading and writing, but also could be really efficient at it because I was in the middle of taking a test. And so I had favorite readers I liked to use for those things. The other thing is the professor had to be around. So the professor and I would sort of negotiate what times would work for me taking the test. And then I would have to find a reader who could sort of meet those times. And I would, of course, do everything I could to make sure that my favorite readers were administering the test. I never really thought much about how you could sort of use a system like that to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> like I could bring my best friend in to just take the test for me. I never even really considered that that was a problem. I was a pretty upstanding young man, and I brought readers in to do reading. But I realize now that a system like that is, is a big candidate for abuse. Mostly taking place now is that universities kind of pick the readers, and that's a real mm. problem because you don't have any way of vetting the reader and making sure that they are efficient. And that you and them have a rapport about how you want things read to them. I would think it's kind of like a dual-edged sword where the professor is sitting right there. You really can't conceal your knowledge or lack thereof if he's listening to your interaction with the reader and the writer. He's right there. Well, so generally, if I had a reader doing the test, the professor wouldn't be right there. The professor would be in another room doing his his own thing. It did wind up being the case on a surprisingly large number of occasions where the professor would just give me the test. While I was okay with that because the professor knows the material and so I can usually get him to read things in a way that would make sense, it seems like a huge waste of the professor's time. The one thing that was often convenient about it was that I often didn't wind up actually having to take the test. The professor and I would sit and talk about the material. He would ask me how I would go about solving it and I would sort of tell him I would set up the problem this way. And he would go, okay, I, I believe you. Yeah, I did that a lot too. In some cases, that's good. And in other cases, I think that kind of gave me short shrift on the, you know, whether I really knew the material or not. But it, that is often what happened. Yeah, some of these skills that you're developing as you're transitioning from high school to college, you know, how to contact your professor yourself, how to hire and fire your own readers. These are skills that you're going to take with you. So when people are looking for a job who have vision loss are actually developing a lot of skills that employers are looking for. Do you see it that way? I do. Not only are you generally more able to kind of handle yourself, have a lot of responsibility, know how to handle responsibility particularly well, know how to manage other people, even if you're not a manager, knowing how to sort of give people work and check up on them. Those are just really good skills to have. The question that comes up a lot around looking for jobs is when do you disclose about your blindness? For me, for most of my life, it was a pretty easy question. I didn't disclose until I was in the room with them. I kind of felt like I could do a much better job of managing expectations if I was there rather than if it was like on my resume and they had to kind of think about it before they brought me in. And that's a good time to sell yourself too. I think that's right. But what has happened a lot before you ever get in the room with somebody, you are asked to take an online exam or do some other kinds of work that may or may not be accessible to you as a blind person. And so now you have a tougher choice to make. Am I going to find a reader and do this inaccessible work myself? Or am I going to let the employer know that I'm a blind person and I'm going to need some alternate form of exam? Both of which have their good side and their downside. So it's now, I think, a much harder question. But I do think whenever possible, holding that information until you are in a room with the people interviewing you helps a lot. Now, your transition into the workplace happened back in the late 90s, as I understand it, where the internet was either in its infancy or not even in existence yet. Talk about that and how that might parlay into today's students who are migrating into the workforce looking for jobs. <laughs> the World Wide Web is in its infancy. It didn't really exist. I was actually working as a contractor for the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. I was getting bored there. And so I wanted to look for other work, but the web didn't exist yet. And so you couldn't just go to a job job board and look for jobs. So there were a couple of board and board lists, but what mostly happened was that there were email lists. And so I got an email one day from a company called Qualcomm out in San Diego. I was in Colorado at the time, and they were looking for someone to come and join their team. 
And I thought that sounded like a great idea and a lot of fun. So I replied back and I said I was interested. They, I think, sent me a couple of programming questions and said, can you write some example code and show us you know, your work? So I did that. And then they said, great, we would like to fly you out here and give you a job interview. And so far, blindness had not come up at all. The thing I remember most about that was they wanted to put me in a hotel several miles from the office and just have me rent a car. I think what I wound up doing was telling them I didn't drive, but that I would like to stay in this other hotel that's right nearby the office. And they were readily agreeable to that. I don't know if that tipped them off or not. So I flew out to San Diego, checked into the hotel. And I think I checked in on a Sunday night and the interview was Monday morning. I actually, on Sunday night, asked the hotel for walking directions to the office and walked it Sunday night just so I would know exactly how to get there on Monday. And then I did. I walked over there Monday morning and found the front door, let them know who I was, wound up talking with the HR person, talked about my blindness a little bit. And then I wound up interviewing and the interviews all went really well. The one thing that also happened there was that no one asked me anything about my blindness. No one asked me how I was going to do this or how I was going to do that. And that really seemed like a bit of a red flag to me. I really kind of felt like if they don't know anything about my blindness or about me and my blindness, it's going to be really easy for them to just decide that it isn't worth the risk. Near the end of the day, I was talking with the person who's going to be my hiring manager. And I said, look, this is the time when you get to ask me about my blindness. And he was like, oh, no, no, we're told we can't ask those kind of questions. I'm like, I understand that this is an HR thing, but you need to know about me and you need to know about my blindness. And so I'm giving you whatever permission you need to ask me the questions. And so he asked me a few questions that were pretty straightforward. How was I going to get to work every day? What kind of assistive technology would I need? Some other things like that that I answered pretty readily. I think that that really helped get him over the hump. And he's just like, well, I don't know what else to ask, but I'm sure that you have answers. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> so I wound up getting that job and it was a great job. Qualcomm was never a problem for me in terms of getting me the equipment I needed or the readers I needed or whatever else I needed. They were very cooperative about that. So what type of work were you doing with Qualcomm? Programming still? Programming. Basically, my life has been either as a programmer writing tools for systems administration, or then I moved into being an architect where I designed bigger platforms and stuff and mentored other people on how to write programs. Even at Google, that's mostly what I did was to write a lot of code for them. Just to clarify, Jim, while you had some usable vision, obviously, you were a Kane user, were you not, when you walked into that interview? Yes. So when I walked into the interview, they knew, right? I started using a cane in high school. And at the time I lived in Boulder, Colorado, which at that time was a really small, sleepy little town. One of my biggest challenges with my cane was figuring out how I was going to strap it to the bicycle I was riding at the time. And I always look back at that and I'm like, I cannot believe I rode a bicycle. I quit doing that not too long after because I think I ran into something and really hurt myself. So I was like, okay, this is pretty stupid. I mean, I had enough vision that I could sort of get away with riding a bicycle. I got talked into using a cane pretty early by the NFB. It actually turned out to be a very good way for me to solve a lot of problems I was having, not only around sort of tripping over things and always looking down at the ground, but also just as a way of identifying myself as a blind person, not so much to other people, but to me. I mean, I really kind of was a little unclear about my status as a blind person. And carrying a cane allowed me to be a much better traveler and to kind of identify myself as a blind person, both of which turned out to be very useful things. It really helps, especially when you walk into a store that the clerk sees the cane, they kind of get the idea too. So it lets you arrive a little bit early for some explanation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You talked about acquiring equipment through the company. Can you talk about reasonable accommodation? Sure. I have always felt like the company can and should and generally will meet any reasonable requests I had. For sure, I needed a screen reader. I needed them to buy JAWS for me. For sure, I needed readers, much more then than now. But back in the late 90s, I needed people to read me journal articles, textbooks. I needed to learn how to do new things. And the way that you did that back then was by going and reading stuff off of print. Those are the two main things. The other accommodation I needed, which was also not a problem for them, was I needed a way to put the computer screen right next to my face. I mean, literally my face sits two or three inches away from the screen. We needed a way to do that that was ergonomically reasonable. So I wasn't bent over all the time, punching and squinting. So we had somebody come up and build a stand to put my monitor on and then we put the keyboard underneath of it. That actually worked out really well. And then, of course, later, monitor arms came along. The other accommodations I needed, well, they fell into two different categories, but there were two different types of tasks that were just really hard for me to do. One was if I would travel, filling out expense reports. It's just a very time-consuming, difficult process. Originally, it was on paper, and so I needed to get a reader and stuff to, to do all that. 
And then later it was online, but it was a very poorly designed, inaccessible website. And so I just made arrangements for one of the secretaries to take care of that for me. Again, Qualcomm was like, sure. I mean, that's not a problem. So that was one type of task. A task that doesn't happen very often that isn't very accessible. And so someone else would do it. Another task are tasks that were part of my daily life as a technologist, but were not easy for me to do. And they had to do with certain kinds of looking at graphs and looking at other kinds of very visual material. There were two ways that I would handle that. One way to handle it is to go in and fix the code so that it's giving you numbers and other kinds of text-based information that's useful to you. There were times when I did that, but there were other times when I just said, this is a task that someone else needs to do. I am not going to sit and interpret this data all the time, nor am I going to go and, and fix it so it gives me data I can use. So give me some more programming to do or some more other kinds of things to do and give somebody else this task. And again, Qualcomm did it for me. Again, I think that Qualcomm trusted me to make good decisions about what I could, couldn't do. And also Qualcomm knew that I was bringing value to the company. They would make these decisions and they would understand the trade-offs, but they were totally you know, fine with it. I think it would actually be a lot harder today to get started because of the fact that a lot of what I would have been doing now if I had gotten hired is much more visual and much more inaccessible. And so I would have had to spend a lot more time interacting with Qualcomm and getting them to fix their websites or fix their other things so that I can actually do the work. I'm now at a place in my career where I am mostly doing planning work and other kinds of work that I know how to do and that other people are doing the day-to-day -day technical work. But over time, Qualcomm, like most companies, have kind of grown and their equipment has become less accessible. They understand the problem, but it's just such a hard problem to fight. The inertia will take you in inaccessible directions unless you fight it really hard. And that is something that the NFB and lots of other places are kind of fighting for and advocating for. Is don't let yourself go down this inaccessible road because you'll make it really hard to hire blind people in the future. You make a good point there, Jim, about today versus then and tasks that may or may not be negotiable, for lack of a better word, because reasonable accommodation essentially, by definition, is intended to allow you to perform essential job duties. So if the employer deems that some of those tasks are not essential, then they shouldn't have any problem offloading those to a secretary or whomever, as you described. But if they're essential right. duties, then there may be a tough point to work with them on. Well, the other thing is that these days, there are also far fewer secretaries. I mean, I am lucky that I kept track of a couple, but 20 years ago, there were a lot more of them. And now a lot of people are expected to do their own secretarial work. Right. It's overhead. It's hard to find people around who are available to sort of do one-off jobs for you like that, right? So you wind up either hiring readers more or, you know, doing other things, but it's harder to find people who are just around who can do reading at the last minute or fill out forms or other kinds of things like that. Yeah. Times have changed and so has the technology. And now with IRA, as a reasonable accommodation, I think some people could justify using the IRA technology, the smart glasses, to access stuff. I think that IRA is absolutely going to be an invaluable tool for people in the workforce. And in fact, IRA knows that. IRA has several programs in place right now to help people get jobs and help employers figure out how to pay for the service and when the service is going to be valuable and when it's not. I have to say that I have lots of conflicting feelings about IRA. I have it and I use it and I enjoy the service a lot. The way I tend to think about IRA is as a reader, where the definition of reader is sort of broadened a bit. There were always tasks I felt like weren't good tasks for me to get a reader to do because basically the reader would be doing the work. So for example, reading documents and filling out forms, right? There's really no reason for me to be involved in that process if the point is to get the forms filled out. And so that kind of feels like not something I want to hire a reader for. That's something that the company should just sort of take care of. Reader is to get me information and sometimes to, for me to give other people information, but I should be involved in that process. How I feel about Ira in this case is that if Ira is giving me information that I need to do my job, I think that's great. But if Ira turns out to be the entity doing my job, then I think that that's going to be a problem. I also want to say that, that I think that Ira is also going to be an interesting tool for blind people to learn how to incorporate into their toolbox because I think that it's entirely possible that there will be people who won't learn the blindness skills I learned 20 years ago because they'll just start relying on IRA for that. And I think that's going to be an interesting give and take about how we as blind people develop over the next 10 or 20 years. But I am hoping that we figure out a way to make sure that blind people still learn the blindness skills that have served me so well. 
Well, you know, Ira does insist that travelers who use their product use their cane or their dog, but I'm not sure that applies to any other tasks. That's right. I'm glad Ira does that. I just think it's something that came up early and Ira put a policy in place and I like that policy. I'm just real glad that Ira actually went to the NFB, to the AFB, to all these associations and, you know, got feedback how to make this product not an enabling device, something that someone would bypass. Like even using Chloe, the OCR, my wife uses Ira and she said more and more she's using the OCR part because it's so quick and easy to use. So I just mean them as an accommodation, not as a crutch or a one size fits all, this is all I use. No cane, no dog, no, you know, everything like that. I'm just saying like in the workforce, it might be another tool with the changing of times. I agree with you 100%. I think that Ira is going to be very, very interesting to watch over the next decade or so. And I also agree with you that it's good that Ira has embedded themselves with organizations of the blind like the NFB to get some feedback and to get some idea about what's going to work and what isn't going to work. Having said all that, I do also think that how blind people work and live are going to change because of IRA. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. I am looking forward to watching the evolution for sure. Yeah, we've seen changes come. You yourself, from when you went from high school to college to the workplace, you've seen technology come along and it's been changing fast with the iPhone. It's moving uh-huh. so quick. And they always say like, now is a good time to be blind with all this technology. But I'm looking like, what can happen in two more years it's, it's moving fast. The landscape will totally change. I always feel a little uncomfortable when I talk about how my life as a blind person has been enhanced by technology. I mean, it certainly has. My iPhone died the other day and I was without it for 24 hours. And I was just amazed at the number of things I rely on it for. That's just one example of technology. But I also know that if I didn't have any technology, I know that I could take my cane and go downstairs and sort of problem solve my way through my day. I know I could do that. And I mm-hmm. am worried that this is becoming less and less true over time. And I have mixed feelings about it. I definitely think that problem solving skills and the ability to kind of build a map of your world and other things are skills that we need to have, even if we have a lot of technology. Well, skills and confidence, the confidence to be able to apply the skills. I've known people that have two master's degree, but they don't have the confidence to apply them. That's right. A real belief in yourself as a blind person. I go back every so often and I talk to the Colorado Center, which is where I got a lot of this. The Colorado Center taught me how to cook food and how to clean and how to paint. We did a lot of painting of buildings and stuff. They taught me a lot of skills, but really the thing they taught me was that my blindness is not going to be the thing that stops me from doing whatever I need to do. That's not going to be the thing. There might be other reasons. I might not be smart enough. I might not be rich enough. I might not be brave enough, but that my blindness is not going to be the thing. I will figure out ways of dealing with my blindness. And that is the kind of confidence and belief in yourself that I think is really, really important for a blind person. The technology and all the other things, they will come and they will play a role and they will be even important. But a real belief in yourself is, I think, the most important thing. I've always said that if a person has a drive, if they have something that's pushing them, then they can utilize a Colorado center or a training center to help them go further. But the drive comes from within and the technology, as you said so well, enhances some areas or assists. But when you get to the core of it, it's you, it's your determination, it's your self-determination that is going to push you. I think that's right. I think that that's true for everybody. I think that in life, how much you accomplish what you do is mostly determined by your drive, by how much you want to push yourself, what you want to accomplish, what's important to you. And the sooner you can be aware of what those things are, you know, I'm really into this, or I think this is really important, or I want to make sure that these things happen in my life. Whether it be, you know, being a parent, being really good at your job, or whatever it is, I think you're right that having a drive and really having a sense of goals and a sense of what's important to you is very important. Mm -hmm. Speaking of drive and independence, I'd like to segue over to your most recent assignment with Qualcomm over in Ireland. Talk a little bit about that, Jim. That was amazing. I recently moved to Berkeley and was living there and was realizing that I was having a lot of fun in Berkeley, but that I was kind of in a rut. And I didn't have any family responsibilities to worry about. So I went and talked with my boss and I asked him if he had any expat opportunities, a way in which Qualcomm could send me to another country and pay for me to live there for a while. Because often we have offices in Europe and in India that need people from the headquarters office to go over there for a while. And he said he had no expat opportunities at the moment, but that he was perfectly happy if I wanted to just pick an office and go live there for a while. I would have to 
pay for my own housing and stuff, but he didn't really care where I was working from. So I looked around. There's an office that we have in Cambridge, England, which is a little bit north of London. And there's an office that we had in Cork, Ireland. And I went and visited those for a week each and decided I really wanted to go live in Cork. So I spent some time making arrangements and also talking with people about where to live and stuff like that. One really interesting piece of that was I could not find any blind people to talk to. I kept looking around on lists and in other places for blind people in Ireland, and I had a very hard time finding any blind folks to talk to. So I mostly just wound up talking with people who could tell me which apartments were within walking distance of the office. and how the buses were, and a bunch of other things. So I did as much prep work as I could. And then in January of this year, I flew over and was met by the relocation folks who were helping me out. Remember, I'd been on a plane for 12 hours and was pretty ragged out. But they took me to my apartment, and then they took me to a grocery store to get food and you know sheets and some other basic things. The apartment was furnished, but we needed to get some stuff to put in it. And then I basically was on my own. I used my phone a lot to kind of figure out how to walk to my office. I learned how to get to the grocery store and some other things that were nearby. I started to learn how to use the buses. I sort of just had a really wonderful time not only meeting you know, my coworkers and a bunch of other friends I met in Ireland, but also just exploring a brand new place. I spent a lot of time explaining what I needed to other people in Ireland who had never really seen a blind person, and they were all very receptive. Again, if you know what you need and can advocate for yourself, people are often willing to come on board. And so everything from getting some markings put on my apartment mailbox to getting help at the grocery store to a lot of other things. Another really interesting thing about that was I had had the IRA service for quite a while before that but hadn't really used it for much. I had used it on a couple of occasions to identify some objects, but really I hadn't used it for much. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to use Ira for. But one day on a weekend, I had a bunch of time on my hands. And I needed to go grocery shopping. And I really did not feel like dealing with the cultural friction of trying to explain to an Irish grocery store worker the things I was looking for. The names of things are just a little bit different. They aren't used to shopping generally at all. I mean, generally, these are college kids or other people who haven't done a lot of grocery shopping. I didn't feel like dealing with that friction. So I decided to see how Ira would do at the grocery store. And I was, frankly, amazed at how well it went. I was like, there's no way Ira's going to be able to help me with this. The idea of scanning all these grocery store shelves was just really daunting to me. I thought it would never work, but I wanted to see. And I was just amazed. They helped me to not only find the things I needed, produce and milk and eggs and a bunch of other things, but they also just taught me a lot more about what was in the store, where things were, how things were laid out, what's down each aisle. I spent 90 minutes with them, which is more than I would normally spend on a shopping trip. But I learned so much about the store and had such a good time doing it that I felt like it was an incredible experience and one of the really cool ways in which I think Ira is very helpful. In future shopping trips, sometimes I would use Ira. And sometimes, now that I kind of understood the layout of the store, I was able to go and find things on my own or go get near what I needed and call them up and say, okay, I'm looking for the low-fat milk rather than the whole milk, right? And they could pick that out for me. I used Ira for that. I used Ira for some exploring, what all was in the small, what all was in my neighborhood. The other thing that's really interesting about Cork and about Europe cities in general is that streets are not laid out on a grid at all. So there's no way for you to sort of problem solve your way around how to get from here to there. You just have to kind of learn where all the streets are. So in the beginning, I would use Ira a lot to just say, how can I get from here over to, you know, this other place? And then say, oh, uh, <laughs> oh, I see. You have to go all the way over here. They were able to kind of look at maps and kind of help me figure a lot of that stuff out. So Ira helped me quite a bit to get accommodated. I also, when I was over there, took a couple of weeks off and went traveling around Europe. I went to Edinburgh, Scotland, and to Berlin, Germany, and down in Sardinia in Italy, and a couple of other places in the UK, as well as spending quite a bit of time in Dublin and and a few days in Belfast. And again, Ira was just very helpful in allowing me to very quickly orient myself to a neighborhood. Ira is much more efficient at that than what I used to do, which is to ask people for directions, right? People who are not used to giving walking directions, people who don't know how to work with blind people. So in the past, I had to do an awful lot of advocating and educating about, this is what I need you to do. Can you explain this to me again? Can you explain to me this other way? But Ira turns out to be much better at that. And even in European cities where they certainly didn't have a lot of callers, they were very good at bringing up maps. So I do find Ira to be very, very useful for that kind of getting used to new neighborhoods and navigating around new environments.
You know, Jim, we usually ask people what advice they would give to someone that's transitioning from high school to college, but I think you've answered most of those questions through your experience. But do you have any quick advice that you would give to someone that is transitioning? I spent some time talking to the computer science division, the NFBCS at the NFB convention this summer. There were several students and several parents who were going off to college and they weren't actually asking for advice, but they were there and they were trying to ask questions. And the biggest advice I can give them is that nobody's going to look out for you, but you. You need to learn how to make sure that you get the materials you need, that you get the mentoring you need, that they get the tutoring you need, and that you get the experiences that you need. Because otherwise you can easily find yourself as a blind person being sidelined and being given the minimum amount possible in order for them to feel like they can pass you. And that's not what you want out of college and it's not what you want out of life. So you need to decide that it's up to you to get the things that you need in this world. And so self-advocating is the most important thing you can do for yourself and start doing it early so that you can do it forever. Good advice. Well put. We're speaking with Jim Barber. Jim, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story, your views on blindness and independence. And I think that your story is going to be motivational to our listeners because you are definitely one who pushes the envelope in terms of looking for new and different challenges, as you mentioned, being adventurous. And I think that helps build that sense of confidence that we talked about earlier. Well, I think that's within you and you can't create it out of nothing. I think it can certainly be enhanced, developed with a mindset kind of like yours. So we appreciate that. Thanks so much for coming on to Blind Ability. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you both. Jim, if you would like any of the listeners to contact you, if they have any questions or they want to get some advice from you, is there any way that you want to allow them to connect with you? I'm certainly available on Facebook if people want to find me there, but also you can email me at jbar, J-B-A-R, at barcore b-a-r-c-o-r-e dot com awesome we'll put some stuff in the show notes for that and thanks a lot jim for coming on to blind abilities hey you guys this is great thank you very much thanks again jim talk soon you take care all right bye-bye This concludes our conversation with Jim Barber. Jeff and I want to thank Jim for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day. For more podcasts with the blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. And be sure to check out our free app in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. Store.